Let's look at verse 11 of 1 John chapter 3. For this is the message that you heard from the beginning. This is the first message you heard. That we should love one another. That's the message. That's the gospel. That we should love one another. Now, who's the we? All men should love one another. No one would argue against that, but the we John is speaking of are those who do not do as Cain does. That's how he defines those who love one another. Verse 11, for this is the message that you heard from the beginning, that we should love one another, not as Cain. That's what I've entitled this message. Not as Cain. If we do what Cain did, if we are what Cain was, it is impossible to love one another. Without question, there's not a more significant story in the Bible than Cain and Abel. First story after the fall. Now, both Cain and Abel were religious men. They both brought a sacrifice and saw the need of a sacrifice. And one man was accepted by God. And the other was rejected by God. One man, the scripture says, God respected. Now what is it that God respects? It says, Abel and his offering, God respected him. You know, I suppose the highest opinion you can have of anybody is that of respect. And God respected Abel. And he had no respect to Cain. Now, back in verse 10, 1 John chapter 3, in this, the children of God are manifest. This is what is seen. This is how a child of God is identified. In this, the children of God are manifest and the children of the devil. There are two kinds of people in this world before I go on reading, and this is so important. Children of God and children of the devil. The righteous and the wicked. Sheep and goats. Saved and lost. There's no in-between. There are only two groups. Children of God or children of the devil. And he tells us in this verse how they can be identified. In this, the children of God are manifest and the children of the devil. Whosoever doeth not righteousness is not of God. Neither he that loveth not his brother. Now, first question that enters my mind is, what is this thing of the doing of righteousness? Now, we're going to go with God's standard, not man's. When we talk about the doing of righteousness, I know that religious men will take this passage of Scripture and say, well, the bent and tenor of your life is that of doing of righteousness. You may trip up some and sin some, but if you're really saved, uh, the bent and tenor of your life is the doing of righteousness. That's not what that means. What does God mean by righteousness? We'll look in verse 4 of this chapter. Whosoever committeth sin transgresseth also the law, for sin is the transgression of the law. Now that's what sin is. It's breaking God's holy law. It's failure to keep the Ten Commandments perfectly. Now that's how God would define righteousness. I mean, you might not define it that way, but is our definition relevant? No. God's definition of righteousness is the doing of the law. Keeping the law. Look what verse 
6 says, Whosoever abideth in him sinneth not. You know what that means? That means he does not transgress the law. If you abide in Christ, and you're in, if you're in Christ, when God looks at you, he looks at someone who does not sin. Someone who does not break his holy law. Someone who actually keeps the law. Huh. You see, when God justifies someone, that means they've kept God's law perfectly. you believe that? If God justifies someone, that means they've kept God's law perfectly. That means they have never sinned. When God justifies the ungodly, they become righteous before Him. Look in verse 12. Not as Cain, who was of that wicked one, and slew his brother. And wherefore slew he him because his own works were evil and his brothers were righteous. Now notice the way God speaks of the works of Abel. He does not say righteousness was imputed to him and therefore he had a righteous standing before the law although he was still a sinner. I can argue where that's true. But that's not the way the language of the scripture is. It doesn't say he had righteousness imputed to him. It said he was righteous. Hebrews 11.4 says the same thing. By faith, Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, by the which he obtained witness that he was righteous. God testifying of his gifts, and he being dead yet speaketh. This is God's testimony of this man. Look in Hebrews chapter 12 for just a moment. Hebrews chapter 12. This was so sweet to me to think about this. Verse 22, Hebrews chapter 12. But you are come unto Mount Zion and unto the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, to innumerable company of angels, to the general assembly and church of the firstborn, which are written in heaven. Her names are written there. Before I go on, the Lord said to his disciples in Luke chapter 10, they came back and they said, Lord, even the devils are subject to us through thy name. They were excited about how God was using them. You know what the Lord said? In this rejoice not, that the devils are subject to you, but rather that your names are written in heaven. The general assembly and church of the firstborn whose names are written in heaven in that Lamb's book of life. To God the judge of all and to the spirits of just men. Now that word just is the same word that's translated righteous. To the spirits of just men made perfect. Now I'm a righteous man right now. If I'm a believer, if I'm in Christ, when God sees me, he sees a righteous man. And we're waiting for that time when we're made perfect without sin. But every believer is righteous. Abel was not seen by God as a sinful man who had righteousness charged to his account. He was seen by God as a righteous man. Period. And if you're a believer, God sees you as a righteous man or a righteous woman. And let me remind you, I know I say this a lot, and I hope you don't get tired of it, but how God sees things, that's the way they are. If God sees you as righteous, you know what? It's because you're righteous. It's not because He just pretends that you are. It's because you are. That is the heritage of every believer. Now, this is what the Bible calls justification. The most striking instance of justification, I believe, 
Is that publican in the temple beating on his breast, crying, God, be merciful, be propitious to me, the sinner, the worst man to ever live. Do something about my sin. Remove it. Take it away from me through the sacrifice. You know what the Lord said about that man? He said, I say unto you, that man went down to his house, not pardoned, though he was, not forgiven, though he was. Not shown mercy, though he had been. Not given grace, though grace had been given him. He used this word. I say unto you that that man went down to his house justified. That means he'd always kept God's law. That means he had never sinned. That means he had never transgressed God's holy law. That's what justification means. Now, let's take Lot as an example. Turn with me to 2 Peter chapter 2. 2 Peter chapter 2. Now, what do we see when we see Lot? You can read about him in Genesis chapter 13 through 19. Those are the times when Lot's name comes up. What do you and I see when we see Lot? Well, first of all, we see a very weak and selfish man who refused to defer to Abraham, but he took the well-watered plain for himself, not caring what happened to Abraham. He should have shown deference to Abraham, but he didn't. He wanted his way. He moved into a city for financial gain to the detriment of his soul and the soul of his family. When he warned his sons-in-law about the destruction of Sodom, the scripture says he seemed to them as one who mocked. They couldn't take him serious. Because of what they saw in him, they could not take him serious. When he said something, what's it matter? He said it. He seemed as one who mocked. They would not take him seriously. When the angels told him to leave Sodom, what did he do? He lingered. He didn't want to leave. Even though he knew what was getting ready to happen, he lingered and the angels had to grab him by the hand and pull him out. When he's fleeing Sodom, even while he's fleeing, he said, oh, don't make me go to that place. Let me stay in this city. It's just a little. When he got, tried to get God to change where he was going to go, and the Lord did that for him. And then when he got into that city and hid in a cave, the scripture says he became drunk and committed incest with both of his daughters. And there were two nations born out of that relationship, the Moabites and the Ammonites. And they were a thorn in the side of Israel for centuries to come. Now that's what we see when we see Lot. You agree with that, don't you? That's what we see when we see Lot. Now look in 2 Peter chapter 2. Listen to how God the Holy Spirit through the pen of Peter describes Lot. He delivered just, and that word just is the word that's generally translated righteous. He delivered righteous Lot. Vexed with the filthy conversation of the wicked. Oh, he was vexed living in Sodom. For that righteous man, dwelling among them in seeing and hearing, vexed his righteous soul from day to day with their unlawful deeds. The Lord knoweth how to deliver the godly out of temptation. Now that's God's testimony. That's God's statement concerning Lot. I think it's very interesting that Lot's name means covering. And really, uh, the true man is covered by the flesh. I realize that. That's all we see. But this is God's testimony of this man. Now how attractive does that sound to you? Which testimony do you believe? Well, I see everything I said, but what I know about Lot is he was a righteous man. 
with a righteous soul whom God deemed as godly. The children of God, not only doers of righteousness, but they're lovers of the brethren. Turn back to our text, 1 John chapter 3. Now, everybody that's justified, listen to me, this is not pie in the sky. This is the truth. Everybody that's justified, that means they've never sinned. That means they've kept God's law perfectly. Anything less is not justification. That's the meaning of justification. This is what John says. Everybody that is a child of God, they're a doer of righteousness. That's justification. They're an actual doer of righteousness. It doesn't mean that they have a righteous life most of the time and sometimes they trip up. That's not a doer of righteousness. You know, if you only murdered once, what are you? <laughs> You're a murderer. If you only tell one lie, what are you? A liar. Well, I only committed adultery once. You're an adulterer. You can't look at God's law and say, well, but by and large, I live up to it, but maybe every now and then I mess up. No, you've broken the whole law. The Bible will not allow that kind of thinking. Justification means being a doer of righteousness. You've never transgressed the law. You've never sinned. You've always done that which pleases God. That thrills my soul to think that that's who I am in the Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 11, for this is the message. Oh, no, um, verse 10, in, the, in this the children of God are manifest and the children of the devil. Whosoever doeth not righteousness is not of God, neither he that loveth not his brother. For this is the message that you've heard from the beginning, that we should love one another. Now, what does that look like? This thing of loving one another. What does it look like? Well, he's going to give more sight of what it looks like as we work our way down through this chapter. We'll consider those for the coming weeks. But here's the first thing he says concerning this love of the brethren. Not as Cain. If you love the brethren, that means you're not going to be like Cain. You're not going to do what Cain did. You're not going to have the attitude of Cain. And he goes on to say, Cain was a murderer. And you know no murderer has eternal life in him. But what about this man, Cain? Well, turn back to Genesis chapter 4. Now, if you love the brethren, this is going to be a description of you, not as Cain. Well, what about Cain? Genesis chapter 4. Now, like I said, this is the first story after the fall. Verse 1, Genesis chapter 4. And Adam knew Eve, his wife, and she conceived and bare Cain. Now, my marginal reading says, gotten or acquired. The meaning of his name is um, a fabricator. Someone who acquires a smith. A maker. He's someone who did things and made things. Uh, you women probably would like being married to him. Instead of being lending married to somebody like me who can't do anything. She always I make some kind of statement, well, what would it like to be married to somebody that could fix stuff? Well, I don't know. Yeah, one of these days, maybe. But um, hey, actually, I fixed the commode the other day, so uh, put the guts back in and did it all by myself. I don't know why I'm saying that. but um, At any rate, um, his name means fabricator. And, you know, he thought that he was the promise of verse 15. Verse 15 and I, in chapter 3, And I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed, and it shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. And Eve said, I've gotten a man or the man from the Lord. She thought, this is the promised Messiah. This is the one who's going to crush the Satan's heel who deceived us. Verse 2, 
And she again bare his brother, Abel. You know what Abel's mean, means? Vanity. Vanity. You know, I guess compared to Cain, there wasn't a lot to Abel. Abel was a fabricator. He could do things. He could make things. He was a successful farmer. And Abel's name was Vanity. What a, what a name to name your kid. Vanity. Verse 2, and Abel was a keeper of sheep. He was a shepherd. He kept that which he didn't produce. He just watched over sheep. But Cain was a tiller of the ground. Now this is very significant. He was a tiller of the ground. Look into verse 17 of chapter 3 when God's pronouncing the curse. And unto Adam he said, Because thou hast hearkened unto the voice of thy wife, and hast eaten of the tree of which I commanded thee, saying, Thou shalt not eat of it, cursed is the ground for thy sake. He was a tiller, and he produced things from that which God had already cursed. Cursed is the ground. That was his sphere of operation. He was working in that which God had already cursed. Verse 3. And in process of time, it came to pass that Cain brought of the fruit of the ground, that ground that God had cursed. Listen, if my flesh is in it, it's cursed already. And that's what he's bringing. He's bringing his best. I'm sure that he was an accomplished farmer. I'm sure the vegetables and the fruit that he brought, were the, he was proud of them. He was bringing that which he had made a real effort at thinking God could be pleased with this. I'm pleased with it. Surely God will be pleased with it. I like it. Surely he will. And in the process of time, it came to pass that Cain brought of the fruit of the ground an offering unto the Lord. Now, I have no doubt that Adam had taught Cain and Abel the same thing. He didn't get this from Adam. Adam saw right after the fall where the Lord slew a lamb. And he took that lamb and made them a covering, stripping them of those fig leaves. He taught Cain that. He taught Abel that the only way that a holy God can be approached is through the blood of the coming lamb. He knew a lamb's blood wouldn't do anything, but it's what that lamb represented. I know Abel had faith, believing the gospel, when he offered up, because it says, by faith, Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain. Now, Abel and Cain were taught the same thing from their father. The only way a holy God could be approached is through the coming sacrifice of the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. He knew the gospel. It was meaningless to Cain. It meant nothing to it. It was just religious talk. You know why? Because Cain really had a high opinion of himself and a low opinion of God. So it was just religious mumbo-jumbo. It doesn't really matter what kind of sacrifice I bring as long as my heart's right, as long as I do my best, as long as I present that which I've given the most for and taken the most effort in, and I've, I've really wanted to please God with this. I mean, as long as my heart's right, this is just as good. He couldn't see any problem in what he was doing. He didn't realize how much he was bringing the name of God down by thinking God could accept something that he brought. It just was meaningless. So, you know, you can grow up here in the gospel as clear as it can be preached. It may be meaningless to you, to you. If you're dead in sins, it is. You don't have an idea really of who God is or who you are. Cain certainly didn't. So he brought the fruit of the ground, and he didn't see anything or have any understanding about God's holiness or his own sinfulness. He just thought, this will do. This will do. It's my best. This will do. Verse 4. Abel, he also brought of the firstlings of his flock and the fat thereof. Now, notice, 
He brought the best lamb, the firstlings of his flock. Did he make it the best lamb? No, it just was the best lamb. And he knew that was the one that pointed to the coming lamb of God, and that's the one he brought. This is not something he worked to get. It's just something he saw that God did. And the only way he would come into God's presence, he brought nothing but this sacrifice. He wouldn't dare come any other way. He was acting in obedience to the gospel that he had learned, and he was coming bringing nothing but the sacrifice. He knew God was holy. He knew he was sinful. And the only way that God can be approached is through Christ, through his precious blood. Yes, he believed the gospel just as much as anybody here believes it. Now, Christ hadn't come yet, but he knew he was coming. And that's who he was relying on. And he wouldn't bring anything else. He wouldn't dare bring anything else. The Lamb of God who would be slain as the sinner's substitute. And let me repeat again. Hebrews tells us he did this by faith. He believed the gospel he knew exactly what he was doing. So he brings of the firstlings of his flock and of the fat thereof. And look what this next statement says in verse 4. And the Lord had, what's the next word? Respect. To Abel. To Abel. And to his offering. Now let me tell you something. If you come the way Abel did, do you know the infinite God of glory has respect for you? That's the power of the blood of Christ. That's the power of being saved by the righteousness of Christ. That's the power of the doing of righteousness. That's the power of justification. God has respect. And I, I don't know of a higher view you can have of somebody than to respect them. There's a, to respect somebody. To res God respected Abel. Abel brings the blood of the Lamb and the infinite holy God had respect for Abel. Abel couldn't be seen independent of his offering, but I can say to every believer, because of union with Christ, because of your union with the Lord Jesus Christ, because of His precious sacrifice, His blood, His righteousness, God respects you. It's hard to get hold of that, isn't it? But it's so. God, just like he respected Abel, he respects you. Verse 5. But unto Cain and to his offering. You see, you can't be separated from the offering. Abel could not be separated from his offering, and Cain could not be separated from his offering. Unto Cain, and to his offering, he had not respect. Now, Cain really had no respect for God. And you know, God's going to meet you on the ground you come. He will. If you come on the footing of your own merit, you demonstrate no respect for God. No recognition of His holiness. No recognition of the need of the Lord Jesus Christ. And if you come to him on that ground, he'll meet you on that ground. And he'll treat you accordingly. If you come looking only to Christ and you won't dare look anywhere else, he'll meet you on that ground. He'll meet you on the ground that you come. Now, Cain came offering the fruit of the ground and God had no respect. And look at Cain's reaction in verse 5. And Cain was very wroth. He was mad. And his countenance fell. You know what his anger says? This 
is not fair. That's exactly what he meant by that. This is not fair. What is it? You take a, a little kid that's just old enough to think cognitively and they have thoughts, what is the first thing that provokes their wrath? They feel like they're not being treated fairly. That's why they cry. I'm not being treated fair. This is not right. Everybody's born with this sense of, I want to be treated fairly. And Cain was upset. This is not fair for God to respect Abel's offering and to have no respect for mine. I am being treated unfairly. Cain becomes God's judge and Cain becomes God's critic. That is why he was so angry. You know, whenever somebody objects to the gospel, the fairness of it. How could it be fair for God to elect one and pass by another? How could it be fair for Christ to die for one and not die for another? How could it be fair for God to have mercy on one and not have mercy on another? That's not fair. Now, when I make a statement like that, all I'm saying is I'm better than God and my judgment's better than God. And God's not treating me right. What I'm doing is showing my low opinion of God. How I can say something like that about Him and bring Him down to my level and I'm showing my high opinion of myself. That's all that is. And that's what Cain was doing. This is not fair. Verse 6. And the Lord said unto Cain, why art thou wroth? And why is thy countenance fallen? Now he knew, he knew, he, he knew, but he's going to show Cain what his problem was. And look at this next statement, verse 7. If thou doest well, shall thou not be accepted? If you come the way Abel came, you'll be accepted. It really is that simple. If you come the way Abel came, okay, pleading only the merits of the coming sacrifice and nothing else, if you come the way Abel came, you will be accepted just like him. You'll be righteous before me. You'll do well before me. You see, when Abel brought that sacrifice, that's a righteous man doing that. That's what God calls a righteous man. That's a man who knows the only way he can actually be righteous is through the sacrifice. Cain, you come like Abel, you'll be accepted just like Abel. You know, we could, I love what the Lord said. Him that cometh to me, I will in no wise cast out. You come like Abel did, you'll be received. Look what it says next. And if thou doest not well, if you don't come like Abel came, sin lieth at the door. Now we've all heard of the law of first mention. Here's the first time sin is mentioned. And how is it mentioned? As bringing the wrong sacrifice. There's a lot of other things we could say about sin, no doubt, but here's the first time it's mentioned. And it's mentioned as bringing the wrong sacrifice. Cain was instructed how to come into God's presence by his father, but it meant nothing to him. He thought it was not even important because, after all, his heart was right and he was doing his best. He demonstrated by that he had no knowledge of himself and no knowledge of God. That's why he got upset in the first place. But sin lieth at the door, and unto thee shall be his desire, and thou shalt rule over him if you do well. as the firstborn. You'll rule over him. Verse 8. And Cain talked with Abel, his brother. And I can imagine how this conversation went. Abel, you think you're the only one saved. You're a member of a cult. It's you and nobody else. You think you're the only one saved. How can you be so self-righteous? How can you? What about me? 
Do you have complete disregard for my efforts? Well, you think you're the only one saved. I, I can't stand you. I can't stand your self-righteousness. I can't stand the attitude you have in thinking that your way is the only way and you just cut off everybody else. Your way is the only way. My way or the highway. I can imagine that conversation. And I can imagine how Abel replied. Abel said to Cain, Cain, here's what I believe about myself, if you want to know the truth. I believe that I, in and of myself, am so sinful that the only way I dare approach God is through the sacrifice of the coming Lamb of God. I won't come any other way. You can say what you want about me, but I know there's only one way to the Father, and that's through the Lord Jesus Christ. And I reject all other ways. The way of blood is the only way. And I bet Cain said, blood, I'll show you blood. And then he, what, did he pick up a rock and hit him in the head? I, uh, stick a knife through his ribs? I don't know what he did, but he killed him. He killed him. Thus Abel became the first Christian martyr. And what was the issue? The blood. That was the issue. What was the issue? Grace or works. That was the issue then, and that's the issue now. And I'll guarantee you this has been duplicated millions and millions of times. It might be that you haven't been physically murdered, but somebody wanted to murder you. They did. They didn't like what you were saying. They were angry. You're you self-righteous. You think your way is the only way? Well, this happens all the time. Now, not as Cain. You find me an Abel. Somebody who will not dare approach God apart from the blood of Christ. The successful, particular, effectual, saving blood of Christ. And I'll show you somebody I love. <laughs> Don't you love that person who won't come any other way but Christ? You love that person. I mean, your, your heart goes out to him. You embrace him. That's your friend. You may disagree with a lot of things about him, but you just overlook it. That's your friend. Anybody who looks to Christ only, you love. Now, that's the love he's talking about, the love of brethren. The love of brethren. Brethren and people who have the same father, they're saved the same way. And there is a genuine love to the brethren. Look at how he says this in verse, back to 1 John chapter 3. <clears throat> this then is the message that you heard from the beginning that we should love one another. Somebody says, well, what's that look like? Not as Cain. Not as Cain. Who was of that wicked one and slew his brother and wherefore slew he him because his own works were evil and his brother's righteous. Now you remember when God said to Cain, where's your brother? How should I know? Am I my brother's keeper? He's a smart aleck to the Lord. He speaks disrespectfully to the Lord at that time. Am I my brother's keeper? Well, he was lying. You, you know that. And uh, the Lord said, your brother's blood cries to me from the ground. It had something to say. You can't hide. Your brother's blood cries to me from the ground. What does it cry? Vengeance. Justice. Payback. Turn to Hebrews chapter 12. I've already read verse 23 once. I want to read verses 23 and 24. You come to the general assembly and church of the firstborn, which are written in heaven, and to God the judge of all, and to the spirits of just men made perfect, and to Jesus the mediator of the new covenant, and to the blood of sprinkling that speaketh better things than that of Abel. 
What does the blood of Christ cry? Forgiving. What does the blood of Christ cry? Justify him. What does the blood of Christ cry? Not guilty. The blood of Christ has a whole lot better things to say than the blood of Abel. The blood of Abel said, get him back. Vengeance. Put him to death. The blood of Christ says, save him. Let's pray. Lord, how we thank you for the simplicity of the gospel. How we thank you that through thy gospel we are righteous. Lord, give us the grace to simply take you at your word and believe. Deliver us from our own understanding. Deliver us from our own thoughts. Deliver us from the false notions of religion. Lord, save us by your grace. Keep us. Reveal yourself to us. Lord, don't let us Believe what we would if you don't prevent it. But cause us simply to believe your gospel. Be our teacher, Lord, and reveal yourself to us for Christ's sake. Lord, how we thank you for the forgiveness of sins. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Hey, Matt, come lead us in closing hymn.